Ozure. That's a modern functional programming language. Not only the people who just read the book The Unicorn Project, in which functional programming is discussed, wonder about this new language. Why is it that functional programming has become more and more interesting in today's business world? I wondered what was behind this hype and therefore got together with my colleagues Ward and Navim, who helped me to better understand Clojure. Hi, I'm Martin Kramer, Client Principal at ThoughtWorks. In this episode of Tech Talk, we take a closer look at Clojure. In our discussion, we talked about the functional paradigm, look at immutability and why Clojure is well suited for parallel processing. Also, why understanding the paradigm behind Clojure can make you a better developer. We take a look into actual Clojure code, starting with a simple Hello World example and closing with how a map reduce looks like in Clojure. How difficult is it to learn Clojure? How about performance? How about developer productivity? And what can help you to get started? We covered a whole lot of ground, so without further ado, let's take a look at Clojure. With me, I have Ward and Navim. Hey, Ward. Hi, Martin. Good hey, to Navim. be here. Hey, hey Martin. Look, um, uh, we, heard, we, we talked about Clojure. I've, I've read in a, in a book, um, Unicorn Project, something that Clojure is a great and exciting programming um, language. Um, I understood that this is something about functional programming. Can you tell me, is that correct? Or what, what kind of paradigms behind um, Clojure? Uh, Clojure is an exciting technology. I, I, I think we, Naveen and me, we both, we both will, will agree on that. And um, it is exciting to me because indeed it combines these um, functional paradigm and functional uh, ideas out, out of a functional world, which is sometimes a bit academic, with a very generic and, and general purpose uh, uh, goal. So it runs on, the, on, on Java uh, standard software. It can be used in a lot of normal business situations. And that's where I think it, it, it really, really is something unique. It, it kind of combines these two worlds, one very academic and the other one very uh, pragmatic. Mm, okay, so um, the, the, the paradigm is probably not so really new because when I remember I was in university, we talked about Lisp and, and, and functional programming. And I understand that um, now Clojure is um, something new, but it falls in the same category, right? Yeah, I think uh, functional paradigm, I mean, it, it's sort of a bit subjective, uh, given that uh, even object-oriented language such as Java has already embraced, you know, these functional paradigms with the Lambda and, you know, other things. Uh, so one interesting thing that I really like about Clojure or any functional language in general is that, uh, in a sense, I think programming language is more about composition. Like you have this one big problem which you break it down into smaller one and then you hope that they sort of compose uh, with each other. And uh, with object-oriented languages, you have lots of design patterns and all that. Uh, but one thing which is like especially uh, uh, unique to functional programming, which Ward also mentioned that, uh, you know, having this academic background. So it's very, very mathematically inclined. You could like in theory mathematically prove that all these small pieces would eventually compose or you could verify whether they'll compose or not. And that's where these uh, things like Lambda calculus and uh, category theory comes into play. But that doesn't mean that you have to know all these things, but it's just good to know that, you know, there's a guarantee that these smaller pieces would actually compose with each other. Yeah, yeah. the bit yes. mm, that's, yeah. that's interesting. I, I also like, sorry, I just wanted to add, Martin, I think uh, you mentioned it is, um, it is a functional ID and a functional mindset. I'd also like to add that I think it is a very valuable experience for people to learn Clojure, even if afterwards they never use Clojure again. Because like, like Naveen said, a lot of languages have these, uh, these constructs or have at least a possibility for these functional constructs, but it's a different way of thinking. And, and by using a language like Clojure, you train yourself in a different way of thinking. Um, I, I, I just got an email from somebody who was on the account for two years. And in the beginning, was very skeptical against Clojure. And in the end, he wrote email 
where he said that he's going to miss Clojure. He, he, he's a JavaScript person, but he said that by using Clojure, he kind of learned and started to appreciate some functional paradigms that he could also use now or that he used more often now in, uh, in JavaScript. <laughs> that's very, well, that is quite interesting because I've, um, I've I've just looked it up in the um, in the book in the, in the Unicorn Project, and pretty much this exactly phrase was there that learning closure or these functional principles was uh, one of Maxim's uh, uh, most exciting uh, experiences. But tell me about wh why that is. Why? Uh, how does that change your thinking about programming? For me, it's a bit, or it was a bit like the difference between writing uh, basic i think that was the first language that i learned i was writing i, I got this very old laptop that even used only uh, normal aa batteries and it would work like two weeks on, on just these four aa batteries and it had a basic in interpreter and i learned basic there and this this is a very like procedure language right you just mm -hmm. write line do this ten, that, print. Yeah? exactly do that do that do that and then later on, I learned SQL. And, and even if a lot of people will complain about SQL, I think the, the fundamental different approach of SQL is that you describe what you want, not how you want it. And for me, Clojure has something similar. So in Clojure, you're much more thinking about what the outcome should be and not how you get there. So it, it offers you a lot, of, a lot of tools and a lot of abstractions that make it easier for you once you get, once you get a hold of it. It is, it is a steep learning curve. I will not deny that. But once you get a hold of it, it makes it much more declarative in, in a way. Mm -hmm. and I, I really, really enjoy that, that of thinking and, and problem solving. Now, I wanted to go back to what Naveen just said, that it has this mathematical foundation. Now, I find it interesting that um, it, is, it is also becoming quite relevant in the business world. And just having a mathematical foundation was not a qualifier for becoming relevant in the business world. So I wonder, um, why why people started um, in um, in the business world talking about this um, this programming um, language and also the underlying uh, principles? Why why do we see it? Why do we talk in this business environment more about it? I think that's a very very interesting question. So what what I have seen in recent year, there has been a shift toward like immutability. You know, like I have worked on projects uh, with .NET, Java, and other object oriented work, and I have spent hours debugging issue that was caused because of some you know mutable state and data being accessed concurrently. Uh, so I believe like the object oriented programming. Uh, so one of the main premises of the object oriented programming is that the data hiding. And when you club this data hiding along with lock and mutex, which are like construct to uh, have multiple thread accessing same data, uh, this this is I feel this is a recipe for very dangerous and buggy code, and and immutability seems like a solution to it. And this is not just confined to a language itself. This is not confined to closure. So closure it's immutable by default, which is one of its greatest uh, advantage. Uh, but there is a, like shift uh, towards this immutability in terms of like uh, databases which are like only append only. They don't mutate anything on the say because it makes whole coordination in a distributed system a lot more easier. Uh, you know, like there's a shift toward uh, immutable infrastructure because you don't have to worry about updates. Like if you update it once and you can read it as many times, it's guaranteed that it won't change. So there is this whole shift toward immutability uh, doing append only and if, Closure and or probably other programming, uh, other functional languages embraces this fact. And this makes a whole distributed system and the concurrency and scalability a lot more easier compared to any object oriented language or other mm -hmm. language. Great. Yet, um, yeah, Naveen, you, you need to help me a bit with that. Uh, so, so my thinking is that we need to change the data. For example, I'm, I'm coming out of object-oriented programming. I understand that you just need to change the internal state and that and now I hear that uh, with immutability, this is not the case anymore. But, but how does it work? You need to explain that a bit more. Why, how can we just have something that is not changing anymore? Uh, construct. Can you, can you help me with with that a bit? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, uh, uh, a simplest, uh, I mean, you can probably achieve the same effect in object oriented work. Uh, so what you do is like you have an object or any data set, data structure, 
uh, you don't mutate it. Every time you do a change on that, you create a new one. Right. Mm. And in the past, there was a, this was a problem, uh, especially when you have large data sets. So you would worry about, uh, you know, memory, like because storage wasn't cheap. You would uh, worry about computation power because we didn't have multi cores, right? Mm. Uh, but with this, this advance in technology, like the storage is pretty cheap, the SSD, RAM, uh, even a normal laptop will have four cores at least. So all these things become much cheaper. And which means that all the operation, like you don't update the underlying data structure, you don't change it, but what you do, you create a new data structure yeah. on top of it, which makes, uh, which requires a bit more memory footprint compared to object-oriented work, but then it is, it becomes much easier in terms of, uh, you know, coordinating these changes. Yeah. So if you have a reference to a certain value, that value will never change. Maybe there will be a new updated reference to an updated version of that value, but you can you are almost certain that if you if you have some point in time you have a certain value, it will remain there. Maybe we should add, Naveen, that it's not just because the memory is is much cheaper now, it's also a lot of work went into closure to make this immutability as, as efficient as possible, right? So the conceptual there is a new copy. But in, in practice, it will only copy these things that are changed. It's a very smart, uh, very, it's a lot of work that went into the implementation of, of the data structures so that it's still relatively uh, um, uh, efficient. And, and, and now, look, how does that um, then lead to the advantage in, um, in multi-threaded in, in environments? Because you cannot change that anymore. Um, you know, there's an, say an object or a, a structure and that is, that is not changing anymore. So you know really what the value of that is and um, that helps uh, in, uh, in multi-threaded environment. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. So if you don't have to check whether the value changed since the last time, for example, a certain thread will read a value, do some manipulations on it, and then write it back. But if at the same time another thread is doing the read, you would have two different threads operating on the same thing, writing this, their, their changes back, and the last one will overwrite the first. The first one will never figure out that, that the change was, is gone. In Clojure, because of its immutability, there's a possibility to just look at the change, and the thread that writes back the change will check whether the value is still the same, if it's not, it will just reapply the change to the latest value, which makes a whole lot of problems just disappear. Mm, okay. And, and because, because like Naveen said, threads and, 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 and cores have become so much more, I mean, the, the, the Moore's law, the gigahertz is not going to double anymore and, and any, every 10 months, right? But it's the amount of cores that is going to uh, increase. So it's very important that, that that software that we write now is very robust towards being executed on a lot of different cores at the same time, not just very quickly. But nevertheless, I mean, people might still be concerned about performance. Um, uh, is, that, uh, is that an issue? Is there certain things that you should not tackle with closure? Uh, is that uh, limited to a certain amount of business problems and, and you would not use it in computational problems? Um, um, Closure runs, so the closure is defined or, or the, the, the goal of closure is to be a generic general purpose language. So in that sense, writing simulations is probably not where, where it was meant for or, or mm. doing some other high number, so number crunching operations is probably not where you would by default go there. On the other hand, it's on top of the JVM, so it's already some kind of uh, limitation. The JVM is already an abstraction, so if you really need all the power of the machine, you, I don't know, maybe you would write something in C or, or something mm -hmm. lower level. But if you are okay with the JVM, Clojure always allows you to break through the abstraction and access the Java underneath directly. So any, any Java code that you can write, you could write in Clojure as well. So you could have this kind of generic glue if you want the closure code could be the the, the 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 surface that is easy to work with and it's easy to reason about and then these parts that are executed a lot of times there you could break down and go into the java do, do direct uh, array manipulations for example instead of using immut immutability and, and the copies mm -hmm. that is that is always a possibility yeah now then where would be the environments that you would want to use closure. We, we, we talk about um, uh, complex systems um, with front ends, with back ends, uh, with, with databases, uh, um, uh, with web, with, with mobile front ends. Um, where's the best place to, um, to get started with closure? Uh, yeah, so with our uh, 
current uh, project that we are working on. So we mostly use it for backend. Even though there's a there's a like pretty good community even for the front end uh, part. Like uh, you have uh, nice frameworks. Uh, but for us, we are mostly using uh, Clojure for the backend because it fits pretty well. So one of the biggest uh, advantage that I see with the Clojure is like uh, its power to manipulate data and transform data. And when I look at any web application, it, it's sort of a data pipeline. There's a request coming and there's a response going back. So it's, it's a pipeline. And in, in between, we do lots of transformations on that data or fetch data from somewhere and do the transformation. And this is like closure superpower to do the this data transformations, uh, which I think is a pretty nice use case for closure. I agree completely. This request response is exactly a map of a function which takes arguments and returns something. And that's uh, it's a really nice uh, paradigm for that. Brilliant. Um, now, look, uh, when we talk about this technical stuff, we need to see a hello world. Um, uh, could you uh, could you show us how that looked like? I've never seen a, a code in Clojure. Um, maybe you could um, show us how a simple example would look like to get a feel for yeah. that. Happy to try. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen here. See can it? you see my screen? Okay. Yes. So this is an editor that is very popular in, in, uh, with Clojure developers. It's called Emacs. And the reason why it is popular, I think, is because Emacs is, for, first of all, it's a very, it's a very mature uh, editor. It's been around for a long time. And since the beginning, the way to customize it was to write Lisp code. And now Lisp <laughs> is the family of languages where Clojure is like a modern incarnation from, right? So it, mm. it looks pretty similar. So a lot of people writing uh, Emacs customizations were getting um, uh, attracted to Lisp. That's actually also how, how I started with, with, with this kind of language. And then looking into ways to use Lisp, Clojure is actually one of the more um, pragmatic solutions because it runs on the JVM and you, you don't have mm. to, you have actually the whole, the whole ecosystem of Java. So this editor is, is quite popular. Um, it, on the top, you'll see uh, an, a file that is opened here, just a normal file, like any other file you would edit in any other editor. And on the bottom, you see something that is, I wouldn't say unique to Lisp families, but it's, kind of, it's a kind of superpower, I would say. This is called the REPL. So any kind of code that you were writing here or that you just want to try out, you can, exact, you can execute directly here. So I can mm -hmm. write any kind of closure code here, and just write plus one one, and it returns me two. And um, that, that, is, that is one of the nice things you could do uh, with Clojure. So any kind of, it, I wouldn't say it makes unit testing um, less relevant. I think you just do test-driven development as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But it makes a lot of unit tests not needed anymore because you can just try out stuff. If it's just a unit test, okay, could argue that a unit test that just tries out stuff is not a good unit test. But it has been helpful for me, definitely, while developing to try out some things before actually using it. Just do it in the line and just write it down. I thought a bit of Python, what is happening yeah, there. What you... Exactly. So Python has this thing as well, but it somehow was always a part of the Lisp community. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to write a function that will print hello world, right? Yeah. So parentheses, function... I can see, already see that. Oh, yeah, I that is. That is... That. Huh? That's so, a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything. If you have a problem, just add more parentheses and then it will, the problem goes away. Mm -hmm. So the way that you write a definition of a function or any kind of symbol actually is to start with the word define. Then you give the function a name, for example, foe. And from now on, everything that you write will be the implementation of foe. So I add another parenthesis level here, and I call another function, print. And this will be hello worlds. Now, this function now is in the file. If I want to have it in the memory of the REPL, so to say, if I want to have it available, I have to evaluate it. And that is a combination that I can do pretty easily here, except that I missed some part. I need to give the argument list. Okay, so now that I did that, mm -hmm. um, let me try again. Okay, so the REPL tells me now that there is a symbol called foe. And if I go into the REPL and I call foe, so this is actually how you call functions, right? So in Python, mm -hmm. you would write foe and then the arguments. In Clojure, you just start with the parentheses, you write the function name and the arguments, if any, would follow there. Okay. There are no arguments to this function, so I just do uh, full in parentheses and it, it prints hello world. So this it's is a, it's a bit of reverse notation. Um, 
Exactly. It's Polish reverse notation. I think you start with the operation and then you add the arguments. It says a lot of really nice advantages. For example, some functions can are, operate on, on, on a variable number of arguments and then it doesn't matter, right? You just start with the function and you add any kind of number of arguments behind it. Mm. So yeah, that's hello world here. <laughs> That, that's hello world. So it doesn't have any uh, uh, any parameters right now, uh, but you could, you could define them in the um, in the yeah. square parameters there and add them in there. So this is this is functional, um, like like you would do in in C, for example. So if you would not have C plus um, plus, that is quite similar. But um, can we see somehow the the mutability that that you talked about there is? All right, let me try to give an example of that. Um, so for immutability, I'll define a, um, a list. For example, call it a list of names. And let's put Ward, Naveen, and Martin in here. Now if I, again, I evaluate this thing. I'll have a list names, and if I go into the REPL and I evaluate names, you'll see that there is Bart, Naveen, and Martin. Mm -hmm. Now, in any language, this kind of list you would be able to add or remove something from, right? So I could yeah. say join, this is the closure word for that, um, names, and let's add somebody else, I don't know, that. Now, you see that the return value of this function is a new list, which has not just Wart, Martin, and Naveen, but also Ted. But now the thing that is, that is different from most other languages is that the original list, so names, is still, still there. only the tree. So the, the, the functions that operate on, on, on collections, on immutable collections, return a new copy of it with the mutation applied, but the original value is still the same. So if we would like, like have a, uh, implement um, a list of participants in this webinar, um, uh, how would it look like? How would you store um, these? Now we have Ward, Naveen and Martin in here. Um, let's say somebody comes in and um, uh, how would you store this, this list then? How would that work? Um, yeah, so I guess Naveen also said this in the beginning. By default, everything is immutable. There are certain use cases where you need this mutability. So there is always a way to say, I don't need, for this specific use case, I actually need a mutable list. And um, the, the case that you are uh, giving here is actually not a bad case, where we actually would need a mutable list. And in that case, you use a different construct. You use an atom is what it's called. And an atom is a way that Clojure offers you mutability with some of the safety features of immutability applied already. So let's say uh, participants here, participants. I can just uh, just use an empty list for now. And mm -hmm. so this would be a mutable data structure, but if I wrap it in an atom, uh -oh. if I wrap it in an atom, now there is a possibility to mutate. So let me add this thing again to the REPL. So let's see participants here. Participants, oops, participants. So the, the list is, is, is empty. Mm -hmm. And now there's a way to say um, mutate this list and add Naveen to it, for example. And now if I do participants again. I actually have a mutated object. So in certain cases, it is still an option to go to this uh, mutability. But you would declare then explicitly, right? Explicitly. Make it explicit, exactly. And this, this function here, so the swap operation that I had to use, and I know, uh, so this function here, actually offers a lot of the things out of the box that you would normally do manually with locks. So if, for example, two threads would try to do the same uh, update at the same time, there would be a way to retry this update mechanism. Ah, okay. So it's built in uh, uh, into the language um, already exactly. to, to synchronize the different threads um, that you'll be working on. So you don't have to take yeah. care of that yourself. Exactly. And and look, as, as we just did this, we already see that you're um, 
kind of um, checking or, or um, testing your code by going back and forth into the REPL. And, um, and so what we talk about, the batch sizes that we <laughs> need to have lower batch sizes, you don't write a whole bunch of code, but you already go back and, and do like a, like a unit tests um, already on the command line while you develop the code. Is that correct? Exactly. This, this is a this is a this is a way to get to know the language and the the, the, li the library behind it better because you don't need to run the unit tests. You can you can experiment much more with, with the functions directly. Yeah, and one interesting thing is like for me personally, like I'll have REPL running for days. Like I would not even restart it. Whatever changes I have made, I would just load that file into REPL and just start working on that. So. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. common in closure word that people have repel running for days, weeks. Yeah. We talked about libraries. Um, um, is there um, lots of libraries available? Is there support on the language? Um, I hear that, that, that this is something that um, for Python is really relevant, that you have a lot of, um, for example, in, in data and machine learning, um, a number of Python libraries available. Um, is, how, how about the support that you get in Clojure? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Clojure has a pretty good ecosystem where you usually would find library that you need uh, one thing that you might find different compared to other communities like you know number of stars on that github repo may not be that many uh, but probably that is because of the uh, small size of uh, closure community compared to python or java uh, but i really like so it, it's not just about being it's not just about the library it's also about the whole philosophy and which i think uh, rich hickey is more of a sort of driving the closure community. Uh, so each each library that we have in closure would only do one and one thing. So we don't have any, so closure community doesn't have notion of framework, which you would usually find in Java or Ruby or any other programming language. So it has this notion of library, one small, each library does one and uh, one and only one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's usually the goal of these libraries. And most of the time you would find it in closure, but if you cannot find it, like what Rod also mentioned, that then you can like sort of break through the abstraction and you can always rely on whatever is out there in the Java world. Like you can use those libraries and mm -hmm. uh, dependencies in your project. I find that interesting because it's also the notion of reducing the batch size. So when you decide or you need something, you don't need to say, okay, look, I'm getting into this um, large library or uh, I need a framework for that that is probably overloaded with lots of uh, uh, additional functionality that you never need, but you can limit that on just, uh, uh, just a function call that you... Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's like the Unix philosophy, right? Do one thing and do it well, and then you can compose. You compose and that's it, and you, you, comp you compose the different exactly. uh, yeah. pieces of that. When we talk about composing, it's a, uh, a thing that I find interesting because you will not use um, just one um, language um, in a business environment on its own, but uh, you need to, um, on the front end, you have probably lots of JavaScript um, uh, libraries. Uh, how does it work together with un uh, other environments? I heard um, it's JVM. So, so that already means something. You, you probably works well together with Java. Yeah, so just to repeat that point again, I think Naveen just made it with everything that is available for Java, all the libraries, all the tools, I mean, all the libraries that are available for Java, that are in Maven or in any kind of repository, you can just include in the Clojure project as well. Sometimes the code will look a bit less Clojure-y if you have to access Java code directly, but you can always write a thin abstraction layer and, and, and then you have access to all these things. So all the JVM-based languages, there is a way to integrate with them. For example, I mean, yeah, so everything that runs on JVM, there is a way to integrate. You can write Clojure code and call it from Java. You can write Java code and call it from Clojure. And I've never done it, but I assume with Kotlin, it's something similar, Groovy, all the other JVM languages. You could probably find a way to call functions or to, 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 to create interaction between the two. Then you mentioned uh, front-end. I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, Naveen also mentioned it already. Uh, there is a Clojure version that runs on the JavaScript interpreter. So there is also a way to write exactly the same code, but then instead of compiling it for a JVM, compile it for the browser. So in theory, you could have this one uh, project where you use one language for both front and backend. And I think 
that is an amazing uh, an amazing idea. I've never tried it myself personally, but I think it's an amazing idea. And also there, there is a way to integrate Java uh, libraries with uh, Clojure libraries. And then of course there's all kind of, I mean, if you talk front and back end, there is all kinds of uh, interactions using REST or using protocol buffers. That, that is a, that I think that is just the same for every language, right? Clojure yeah. is also supporting all, all okay. of these things. So that's how you could interact. Mm -hmm. Now, Fox, you, um, um, you, you started, I believe, uh, on the current engagement where we use um, um, Clojure. You started with that. How long did it take you to get uh, uh, acquainted with this new um, uh, language and environment? Uh, how about your learning curve? I think most people yeah. that start, I mean, Naveen, maybe you can start. And then can, yeah, sure. I can, I can uh, add things in. Yeah, probably. So when when I started on this uh, project, uh, we were already using Clojure, and for me, like it took me a week to get myself uh, familiarized with uh, you know uh, the new syntax of Clojure. Uh, but I think Clojure is a very minimalistic language, and uh, I think Rich Hickey also sort of stresses on this thing that we don't want to introduce accidental complexities by adding a lot of those features. So if you compare Clojure with Scala, which has both object-oriented and functional paradigm mixed together, it has so many features, and uh, which, which adds to the accidental complexity in the sense that you could use any paradigm. There isn't one way to do things. And even, even from learning perspective, there are so many things that you have to learn, but Clojure has very minimal syntax. Like you could get started uh, with, uh, on, the, on the first week, you could be productive after one week. And then they're like, definitely you can go as deep as you want. And I mean, that is, you know, you would never be able to uh, know the language fully, but yeah, in a week, I think you can get very productive. I think it depends where you're coming from. If you're coming from other JVM languages, you already get a lot of stuff basically that you can carry along because you know the ecosystem, you know the libraries, and, and you know how to interact with the libraries. I, I do think that people who come from more object-oriented languages have a phase where they go through, I mean, my, that's definitely what I went through, where you write just Java code with parentheses around it, right? People are surprised with the parentheses in the beginning, and then they start adding them around their code, and then they, after one week, they're probably okay with the parentheses. But their code is still very procedural, very very object-oriented almost. Like, like, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then the mindset change of, of, of looking at it as a more declarative language of, of, of thinking about transformations of, of, of streams. For me, that took a bit longer. It took two, two, three months, I think. And since then, I learned these concepts behind Clojure. Like, like Naveen said, the language itself is very minimalistic. But to get the concepts right, I think sometimes me definitely took, mm. took a bit longer. Yeah. I understand I from that, that makes it like, like a better programming in the end to, to have another concept available to f look yes. at programming from a different angle. Uh, on that, um, and that probably helps you once you go back. I think you mentioned that in the beginning. Exactly. Um, that that helps you to to spot maybe maybe defects and bugs um, or, or, or difficult areas in even if you go back to Java or, or C plus plus. Definitely, or definitely. Yeah, I think one thing that I didn't mention was that uh, I was already familiar with functional. I was working with Elixir online before, so yeah, I remember now like this whole immutability thing was a big hurdle in terms of learning because in Java, what you could just mutate, you know, you can do inside a for loop, and then you have to think very differently in functional language because you cannot mutate inside a for loop. So you have to think in request. Yeah, so that's that's another thing that I had to sort of grapple with, but I, I didn't do it with closure. Yeah. Hmm. Now, this um, my, the initial question was on your personal uh, productivity or learning curve. How about the, the productivity that you see um, when writing uh, closure code? Um, for example, I always felt when I was still writing um, Java code that you just needed to write a lot of a, a, a lot of framework or a lot, a lot of code actually that would not yet just do anything. Um, so, does it help you to to have less code um, and 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 be more explicit or what's your point on that yeah uh, i would i would uh, sort of uh, tell you a story so when i initially joined the project like i was uh, i finished a story it took me three to four days and then i looked back at code and those were like five ten lines and i was like oh am i really slow and it happened in the next story and the next story and then i realized no this is how it works in closure so most of the time we spend you know, like designing a solution, uh, 
you know, refining business requirements, talking to colleagues, like what should be in there. So most of the time we were spending time in the discussion and designing. And when it came down to code, those were like, you know, five or 10 lines. And that's a level of productivity you get out of closure. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I read the quote once, I'm probably going to quote it wrong now, but it's something like, the, the code is not ready when there is nothing left to write. It's ready when there's nothing left to remove. And, and, and in closure, you can get this sometimes maybe too much, but you can get this very compact uh, way of writing a, a problem statement or a solution. Yeah. And but that reminded me a bit of, uh, I was looking into Perl once and Perl was this, this, this language that you could do the same. Like I have one line of, of, of code and that would do enormously difficult things. Uh, uh, but at the same time, being so powerful with this one line that would do so much, uh, isn't there um, a danger um, that you write something that, that you in, in two months time will not understand anymore and even less somebody else coming uh, onto the project um, uh, then sees that and has no idea what this is about. I think Perl is, is very extreme there because they also try to make the operations very short, right? There's a lot of functions that have only one letter or two letters. Yeah. And in Clojure, it's always still the idea is still to have maintainable code. So it, it, I guess you could write code that is too smart, but the real advantage, I would say, or the real gain in, in writing less code is this declarative approach where you can say, not like Naveen said, go with a, a for loop and, and take every value, check whether it's um, whether it's even or not. And if it's even, then add it to some random to some total. You just define a filter for even and then a reducer with sum, which is which is a different way of phrasing the, the solution. And it doesn't become less readable because if you know what reduce does and you know what filter does, it just reads almost like English. You say filter even numbers. So reduce with a sum the the filtered even numbers from range one to ten. So yeah. Yeah. it doesn't become less less just read no no. And I think it, it it is also important to differentiate because I've worked uh, briefly on Ruby on Rails and Ruby on Rails has these like uh, very specialized functions to do one thing. And when I first encountered Clojure, I thought, oh, it feels a bit like Ruby on Rails. And then I realized, no, it's not because this. Closure has a philosophy that, you know, you, you should have like 100 functions which operates on one data structure than having, you know, 10 data structures with 10 functions. And, you know, like if there is a function which is for some, it would work on a list, it would work on a vector, it would work on like a lot of different data structures. So it's not very specialized function that you use for one particular purpose, it's but more of a very general abstraction that could be used anywhere. And I think, that that helps because it's the same code that you're writing everywhere so yeah mm. okay we heard about um uh, reducing and that brings me to an idea um is it also possible to go into this map reduce um, area with closure how would that look like sure i can share my screen again and uh so we were talking about making a list and filtering stuff out, maybe do some operation and then reducing or, or accumulating mm -hmm. everything, right? So I would again start by defining this list, let's say scores or whatever numbers. And this would be just a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Of course, it's a nicer way to write this, but to make it explicit, I will do it like mm -hmm. this. Um, so let me jump to the REPL here so I can live show you what, what would happen, right? So I have this numbers list here available, which is the lists as you see it and without any changes, right? And now if I could do, if I do a map on that, for example, I could say I want to double every element in this list. And this is mm. now, uh, no, sorry, this was the wrong, uh, the wrong function, double casted it into a double. I mean, it, it did what, what it's supposed to do, but it did not times two. So I'm going to do this a bit differently here. Times two. So what I wrote here is an anonymous function. Uh, number is with an S at the end. Sorry. Uh, just one second. So map the times two for numbers exactly mm -hmm. All right so this is this is the first operation you map yeah. yeah and then afterwards on this map you can do reduce
and the reduce takes an operation, for example, plus, and prints this out. So I think this is this is this is a nice piece of code that shows that shows how you can more declaratively uh, think or and, and write code about uh, about about this kind of this kind of problems. That is that is quite concise. Uh, and I, I always um, um, had my my issues with understanding MapReduce, but I must say that this is uh, just one line um, brilliantly show how our MapReduce um, could look like. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. And of course, it's on one line now, so it would be much more readable if it's written on more lines. But yeah, in the end. And the, and the hashtag is an anonymous function, right? Yeah, exactly. So map is a function that takes a function. So this is a higher order function, so to say. It takes a function and applies that function to every element in the array or, or, or actually this, the, the sequence that it's applied yeah. as a second argument. And again, so the immutability here, the numbers itself are not changing. The only thing that is being done is that the, the map function returns a copy of this numbers thing with the uh, function being applied to, to say. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And, and what does the reduce uh, then the do? Um, the reduce takes the, um, um, the plus, so that is, uh, adds all the different members um, uh, from this list. Yeah, so reduce again a high order function that takes a function, in this case, just a simple plus. I could have written this as an anonymous function as well, right? I could say yeah. plus, plus and then the first argument and the second argument. But there is no need for that because there is a built-in operator which we can just use. And it, it basically goes over the list. It keeps track of an accumulator, so to say, and applies each element to so the accumulator, the function, and then each element of the list, one by one, and oh. keeps track with something you can use. Could write a max here as well. Max would then return the, the highest. You could write a min. Mm -hmm. Do any kind of operation and would return that, uh, that value for, for this collection. That's concise, I like that. Brilliant. Look, um, when we have uh, people out there that haven't um, done anything with, with Clojure yet, and um, now after what you told them uh, are inspired to check that out, um, what would be your advice to get started with that new environment? I really like the approach where you do some tutorials and then start, uh, you look for problems. For example, there is a Fantastic website, Project Euler. There is a um, exorcism, I think it's called. Basically, this website gives you programming exercise, and then you solve it with a small program. And then may, mostly you get a data set as input, and you have to return a number. You put a number back in the website. It tells you yes or no, whether it was right or wrong. This is how I how I how I how I practice and how I how I like to learn these mm -hmm. things. Yeah, and I think exorcism is, is really good. So it's not just about solving a problem. You'll have a proper mentor who would comment on your solution, would provide you alternative way of implementing same thing. So I really like the exorcism. And then there is also full closure. If you just you know want to know the closure syntax, it's like one liner thing that you need to do. And then there are some coding katas on data, which are more elaborate problems that you want to solve. Mm. And one more thing, if you want to advance, then I think one, one thing that's really helped me forward at some point in time was to really just read through the documentation of the functions that are part of the core library. And if you see what is all available there, then this, this, this immensely uh, increased uh, my, my, my way of, of how I could try to solve problems. Brilliant. Folks, is there anything else that we, we need to uh, cover with Clojure that would help our um, colleagues um, understand this better? Try it out, I would say. It's it's a fantastic language, it's a fantastic technology. You have this whole Java ecosystem that you can still use. So it's not there is no there's not a lot of risk, I would say, to 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 be by to be blocked in. Yeah. And I think this closure is a very practical or pragmatic language. And by that I mean it doesn't dwell into you know all the category theory and the uh, lambda calculus like Haskell or some other programming languages. It's very practical language. It, all the choices, design choices that have been made in Clojure are very practical. It's for the people who really write, who ship product out there, not for people who are you know, dwelling in academic topics.
Brilliant. Well, folks, um, you really helped me a lot. I had no idea what closure was really about. I just was curious from reading it um, uh, in many articles right now. Uh, Ward, Naveen, thank you really much um, for um, you, introducing that right now. Um, and um, I, I will later on get some um, uh, material how we can, how people can access, get access to us and uh, learn more on that. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Bye -bye it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Martin.